under the age of 15, right? Swears to this day, Peter does, that, that we didn't write that song that had anything to do with. Yeah. Well, good morning, Amalon. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, we'll do announcements and celebration here after our first song. But I wanted to celebrate one thing with you before we start today, and that is we can sing again. There's a qualification to that. We can only sing a total of five minutes. Don't know where that came from, but... Uh, We'll do a couple of songs today that we'll sing and a couple of instrumental songs. So if you see us going from instrumental to singing, you'll know why. Uh, but that is a celebration. We're on the right track. We're moving in the right direction. And that is a moment of celebration for us. Amen? Amen. So why don't you join us for our first song? Will I follow 
close behind her Tried to hold, hold up and be brave But I could not hide my sorrow When they laid her in that grave Will the circle be unbroken by and by? Sky, Lord, in the sky. I went back home. My home was lonesome. Since my mother, she was gone. All my brothers and sisters crying. What a home so sad and alone. Will the circle be unbroken? Sky, Lord, in the sky. Woo! Thank y'all. Feels pretty good, doesn't it? Amen. Well, folks, I do have a couple other things to celebrate today as we move into May 2021. And that is our youth cleanup that happened yesterday. We had some youth show up uh, at the Wanda Campbell's aunt's house. They did a cleanup, and some donation was made to the church for the youth program. They did a great job. They were there for four or five hours, so they did a lot of work yesterday. So I want to celebrate our youth and all of their hard work. <laughs> celebrate the music. Yeah. And this one may seem as an odd celebration, but hear me out. Jack Hamilton, a local pastor, if you remember him, Madison Heights Christian Church passed away. Mike Ogden told me this, that that was in the, uh, in the church or in the uh, newspaper this morning. Now you think, well, my goodness, why would you celebrate that? Well, I'll tell you why I'd celebrate that. Because here's a man that had 50 years plus ministry in this community and touched a lot of lives, did a lot of, probably did a lot of baptisms over the years and brought the gospel of Jesus Christ to Amherst County. And that's worthy of celebration. Amen. So let's celebrate the good lives, just like uh, Hebrews chapter 11, great faith chapter of the New Testament, right, where the writer of Hebrews celebrated, through the inspiration of God, celebrated those believers who had gone on before and done it right. And Jack Hamilton's definitely one that went on bef- has gone on before us now and who did it right. All right, we have a monthly ministry meeting tomorrow. For those who are on the ministry team, you know who you are, 10.30 a.m. via Zoom, or you can come here, so don't forget about that. Uh, there's going to be an informational meeting for the FUGE youth event. Remember, that's 19th through the 23rd of July. We want to try to get youth and participate in that. We really don't have anybody signed up for that yet, so we need to get some youth signed up. We're going to have an informational meeting after the service on May 16th. So Barry Link, Stacy Link are going to have that meeting so please, if you want more information about that as a parent, your youth should be here too if they'd like to go. Let's get some folks signed up for that. You can sign up in the Narthex, uh, but please be at that informational meeting on May 16th. May 6th at noon right out here. It's this week. Can you believe it? Right out here by the flagpole at noon, May 6th, we're going to participate in the National Day of Prayer. So please be here. We're going to have Duncan and Herb are going to provide some music for us. We're going to actually have, we're going to sing, right? Out by the flagpole, we're going to pray for our nation and the future of our nation. So please be here to participate in that. Uh, Also on May 16th, you'll know that we're starting up our new schedule. And our schedule is going to be 9 a.m. Sunday school, right? 10 a.m. prayer service right in here. And then 10.30 service. Uh, Carol Stennett's going to be leading that first prayer service. We want to focus our church on prayer. We want to start looking at, okay... How can we as a church become prayer warriors as we move into the future? How can we put prayer ahead of us, right, so that God's ahead of us as we move into the future in a new and profound way, in a more intentional way? And that's what this is about. So please join us for that prayer service. It's not going to be a church service. It's going to be a time where we get together and share our burdens, our concerns, our joys, our praises, and lift those up to God in various different ways. There's not going to be one set format for this service. 
So whoever's leading it will do it slightly different each time probably. So please be a part of that and support us in that because we want to become prayer war- a church filled with prayer warriors, right? And this is one way we're going to try to do that through our prayer service. All right, Susie Reynolds. Susie's going to come up and share with us for a moment about our children's program and how we're doing that over the next 30 days or so. So Susie, if you can come up here so they can see you on the camera. Can you make it up? or? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. There you go. I'm too old. <laughs> In the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus said to his disciples, Let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them. And I am happy to announce that we are going to resume a children's worship hour starting this Sunday, and it will be held during the church service. We will not be having the 9 o'clock Sunday school service for the children at this time. Um, Shortly after the church begins, we'll dismiss the children. Kimberly Smith, who is our Christian education director, or myself, will take them to classroom four, which is Carol Harding's um, previous Sunday school class, and we'll be meeting there until further notice. Um, The children who don't have face masks, don't worry about it. We have masks that will fit children. We'll pass them out in the narthex as we go to the classroom. And each child also will use hand sanitizer before we go in and after we leave the room. We have individually wrapped snacks and drinks for the kids. So if there are any allergies that we need to know about, please let us know. Uh, We'll be having activities, a Bible story, games or crafts, and of course, snacks. At the end of the service, we ask that the parents pick up their children from the classroom, number four, and rather than bringing them back into the church service. Uh, We'll have a temporary schedule for the month of May. And this Sunday, we will have creation. Next Sunday, of course, since it's Mother's Day, we have a special craft that we will be doing. Uh, The following Sunday, we'll be having uh, a lesson about Adam and Eve. And then the next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. So there again, we'll be making a craft. We're going to make pinwheels. And the last Sunday of the month, we're going to have prayer. We're going to learn the different parts of the Lord's Prayer. So anybody who can help, your help is greatly needed, especially during the Sundays that we're going to be having craft. Uh, As far as future, we have 13 lessons of heroes in the Bible for the summer. And we're not really sure when we'll be meeting. It it just all depends on the COVID. Uh, It may be during worship time or we may go to the 9 o'clock. And then in the fall, we will start Bible basic stories. And that will be at 9 o'clock in the morning with the regular Sunday school time. So we're really excited to be with our kids again. Be sure to tell everybody what we're doing. And we look forward to meeting together and having a good time. Thank you. And I just want to thank Kimberly and Susie for just really picking up the ball and running with it here. We decided some weeks ago that we wanted to get our children's program back up and running. And as you know, we don't have a lot of workers in the children's program right now, so we can uh, announced all those last week, and they're in the newsletter. If you can be a part of our children's program in some way to help out, that would be great. But these two have picked up that ball, and it's a heavy one, and they're running forward with it. And I just want to thank you both for that. And this is going to be a great opportunity to restart that children's program, get it growing again, and and, and get things moving in the right direction. Amen? All right. Do and dismiss the children. They'll take them. (laughs) There you go. Well, folks, let's pray this morning. Father... Thank you for our children. Thank you for the blessing that they are to our church, to our families, to our lives, to the church universal, to our world. 
Thank you for this church. Thank you for the wonderful work that Amelon has done in this community for many generations. And many generations before that, before Amelon was even in existence, through the other two churches, way back in the past. Thank you for the great work that Amelon will do into the future. Thank you for the great work that all the churches in the area are doing to bring the gospel to you. And though there are some exceptions and some bad things that happen in churches, Lord, we know that. We see it in the news. But we also know that your word tells us that church isn't going anywhere and that you're going to be a part of what's going on on this planet in your creation until Christ returns. And we can be a part of that as your church. We don't have to sit back and watch the show. We can be a part of the show. We can be a part of the wonderful work that you're doing. And again, many churches are doing that. Amelon's doing that in so many ways, Lord. And I just pray that you show us, each of us individually, but certainly our church, as we move into the future, where can we do it better? Where can we put our finger on the pulse of our community and, and feel the real need? Where can we put our hands on our community and meet the real need? Where are we specially gifted? Where are we specially resourced? Where are we specially blessed as a church to meet specific needs in our community? And Lord, we've got a team right now in the church that's looking at that. It's going through that and asking those hard questions. I pray you'd show us the answers. And then I pray you'd give us the motivation, the courage, the spirit of fortitude and fight that will allow us to step into the future and meet those needs, to follow your will, to be your church in this community. Lord, there's a lot of hard work to do. And I think sometimes as churches we think that the work is easy. We can just kind of sit back and do it at our leisure. But Lord, we saw what we see in Scripture. We see through the stories of faith that the life of faith is not easy. It's difficult. It makes us confront fear and uncertainty. It makes us confront our own weaknesses. But in the end, through the power of your Spirit, Lord, time and time again in those same stories, we see victory over fear. We see victory over weakness. We see victory over the world. We see victory over our own uh, insecurities and the uncertainties of the future. And every time... We see that victory when people say, you know what, Lord, it's not about me, it's about you. We see that victory when people fall back, as it were, into your arms instead of trying to stand on their own legs. And that's what I pray for us individually and as a church, that we be willing to take that fall backwards into your arms. We be willing to rush and run into the future because we see you ahead of us. Paul says, or excuse me, the writer of Hebrews says, Run with perseverance the race that is marked out for you. See the goal, he's saying. See the finish line and run toward it with all your might, with all your power given to you by the Spirit, with all your courage, with all your fearlessness. Give that fearlessness. Give us that heart of courage. Just like the lion in the Wizard of Oz. Give us courage. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're going to go in, into our message time now as we look into God's Word and see what it has to say to us, see how it can instruct us, see how it can move us into the future. And today's passage is a little longer than normal. It's a lot of verses out of uh, 2 Kings. I had to skip around a little bit so I didn't read for 30 minutes. But 2 Kings, short and chapter 22 and moving into chapter 23. I'm going to read this and we're going to go back through in a few minutes and look at what it really means. It's a wonderful story in the time of King Josiah, king of Judah. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people, for all Judah, about what is written in this book that has been found Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. Hilkiah the high priest went to speak to the prophet Huda. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. She said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, tell the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says, I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people according to everything written in the book the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what was would I have spoken against this place and its people that they would become a curse and be laid waste? And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors. and You will be buried in your peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. In chapter 23, then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. This is the word of God for the people of God. You know, covenants, that's a word, that's a biblical word, isn't it? Covenants are important to faith. I don't know how many times you've thought about a covenant, but let's talk real quickly about what a covenant is. It's kind of like a contract, but better. Now, the parties of a covenant, or we'll call it a promise because that's essentially what it is, when two people or two organizations or two entities covenant with one another, they promise to do things for one another, right? I'll do this for you, and you do this for me. That's what a covenant is. Now, the thing that's good about a covenant over a contract, because that's what a contract is too, right? If I contract with somebody, I say, I'm going to pay you an amount of money, you do this work for me, or something of that nature. Right? So we both make a promise. In a covenant, we typically both, both make a promise as well. The difference in a covenant is that the promise that we make in a covenant is permanent and binding. You say, well, isn't a contract permanent and binding as well? But under the laws of our land, we can break a contract, can't we? There are ways to get out of a contract. In fact, if I want to get out of a contract, I can break it, get fined, pay a penalty, go to court or whatever. I'm out of that contract. Or I can cover, I can get, I can break the contract with somebody else by just going to them and saying, hey, listen, I really want to do this anymore. Do you really want to pay me? No, I don't want to pay you. I don't want to do it. We can break that contract. But a covenant cannot 
be broken. Once we covenant with someone, it's for life. It's permanent. Also, covenants differ from contracts in that sometimes they can be one way. I can covenant with someone, and they don't have to give me anything back. I can say to them, you know what? I promise to do this for you, and I covenant to do this with you, for you, and that's it. It's more like a gift, but that's a covenant as well. So covenants can be bilateral, two-way, or unilateral, one-way. Contracts can be, are oftentimes only two-way. So that's the difference between covenants and contracts. Plus, I can break a contract. I can legally break a contract. In the Bible, we see covenants. We don't see contracts. When God promises to do something for us, He doesn't contract to do it with us. He covenants to do it with us. And when we promise to do something for God, guess what? We don't contract to do something for God. We covenant to do something for God. There's a lot of examples of covenants in the Bible. I mean, they're everywhere. I'll just give you some examples. The, the Adamic covenant, the covenant God made with Adam. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue the earth, and have dominion over it. Work the earth. These were the elements of that covenant, wasn't it? And that was what we call a bilateral covenant. That one went both ways. God said, I'm going to give you the earth. It's yours, and you're going to have dominion over it. And in return for that, you're going to fill the earth. You're going to be fruitful and multiply. You're going to work the earth. You're going to subdue the earth. You're going to bring order to the earth. But that's what you're going to do. I'm going to give you the earth, but you're going to be good stewards of it. Two-way contract that we call a covenant, that can't be broken. Guess what? This many years later, the earth is still ours to steward as human beings. That hasn't changed. And God hasn't taken it away from us, and he won't take it away from us. People say, oh, the earth's going to end. No, it's not. It's going to blow up, and we're all going to die. No, it's not. That's not what Scripture says. The earth is ours forever, for eternity. We're going to live here with Christ in the end. We won't get into the end times theology, but the earth is ours to steward. God gave it to us. And we need to give him back good stewardship, good dominion over the earth, right? Be good leaders of this earth. That's one. The Noahic covenant, God will never destroy the earth again by water. And a rainbow was the symbol of that. Guess what? That was a unilateral covenant. God didn't have to do that. He didn't ask for anything in return. He just said, I'm not going to flood in anymore. I'm done. I did it. I did what I set out to do. I'm done. not going to do that again. It's still a covenant. Has God flooded the earth like that again? He's kept that promise, hasn't he? The Abrahamic covenant. Three elements to the Abrahamic covenant, if you go through Genesis. He first said that the children are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the beaches, right? That was a promise to Abraham. Also, he says he'll give them a land, right? A promised land. We'll give you a land. And the third thing he says is your family, your line is going to be a blessing to all the nations. That was a unilateral covenant, folks. At that point that he made the covenant in Genesis 15, God did not ask anything from Abraham. He said, I'm going to give you these things. Lots of descendants, a promised land, and you're going to be a blessing to the nations. We know it's unilateral because in Genesis 15, verses 9 through 20, we see this interesting uh, narrative, this interesting part of the story where God does this weird thing where he takes the animals and he breaks them into pieces, divides the animals, Scripture says, into halves, half over here and half over here. And then God walks, it says, between the pieces of divided animals. And it's kind of a weird passage of Scripture. And a lot of people kind of skip over that and go, I don't know what that means, so I'm gone. I'll go on to Genesis 16, <laughs> right? But that's important. That was a way in, in the, that Near Eastern world to bind a covenant. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. But they would take parts of animals and they'd divide them. as kind of a sacrificial celebration kind of thing. they divide the animals and then the two parties in the contract would walk between the parts of the animal. Again, don't ask me why. 
but they'd walk through the divided parts of the animals as kind of a seal, a handshake, as it were, to this covenant, this new relationship, this ultra contract that they had just made. That bound them permanently to one another in whatever promises they had made. So it's interesting in this narrative that only God walks through the divided part. Not Abraham. It doesn't say Abraham walked with him. It says God walked through. That's a unilateral covenant. God is basically saying through his object lesson that I'm making a promise that's unilateral. You don't, I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm a God of grace, mercy, and love, and I love you so much that I'm going to give you these things as a gift. And as we go through Scripture, we see that God did that, didn't he? The Mosaic Covenant, the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, the 613 laws that we read in Leviticus and other places, epitomized in Deuteronomy 28. If you read Deuteronomy 28, God says in Deuteronomy 28, if you follow my law, you will be blessed. And if you disobey and don't follow my law, you will be what? Cursed. So he ups the ante a little bit. He asks for some things in return there, doesn't he? He says, I want obedience. I've given you this law, and, I expect, and by golly, this is a great law. It's going to give you liberty and freedom if you follow it. It's going to give you blessing if you follow it. But if you don't follow it, you will find that you are cursed. I will take away the blessing from you. That's a bilateral covenant, isn't it? I'll do this for you, but I expect you to do this for me. And throughout the Old Testament, we see the people at various times promise to God, yes, God, we will follow you. And then, of course, the new covenant instituted by Jesus, embodied in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's a bilateral covenant. God will give us eternal life, but we first must give him what? Belief, submission, obedience. So we see these covenants throughout Scripture. That's just five of the bigger ones, but we see lots of covenants going on. Our God is a God of covenant. And he never, as I said before, breaks his covenant, ever. If you go back through each of these covenants, we can see fulfillment of each one of them through Scripture. And some have not been fully fulfilled yet because we still have a future ahead of us, right? But God has never given up. Hebrews 13, 5 says, He will never leave us or forsake us. He will answer these promises. Many of them in these covenants have already been answered or partially answered, and all of them will be in the end. God always keeps his covenant promises. But, however, unfortunately, we don't do it. How often do we break our promises? We are so often the breaching parties who thumb our noses at God and walk away from our responsibility. We play games with the permanency and the binding nature of the covenant, don't we? We do. All of us at some time or another. And certainly as the church in the 21st century, we have so often and so frequently walked away from our response. Let's get some examples. We, the church, are charged with taking care of orphans and widows. We are told that in Scripture. That is our job. But yet we have turned that responsibility over to the state. How many churches today are truly taking care of orphans and widows? Some are. But so many more are being taken care of by the Commonwealth of Virginia and the welfare system of the United States. And you know why? Because if we don't do it, somebody's got to do it. So it falls on our secular government. We have breached our covenant with God as a church. And I'm not talking about Amalon. I'm talking about the church universal. We, we all have done this. We are not the church we were in the early church. We should be the social program, welfare program. But we leave it to the state. We as the church are charged with helping the needy, which we don't do enough of. We do some great things through Neighbors Helping Neighbors and Helping Hands and Parkview. It's wonderful. If every church did those things at the level that we do them, we would have much less need in our community. And I'm not high-fiving Amalon and, and castigating the other churches around here. I'm not doing that. We could do, all do better, right? But some churches do nothing. Many churches do nothing. So what do we do? We leave that to the state as well, don't we? We leave it to the welfare program. 
We leave it to the food banks that are not associated with churches. And then we gripe about it. Then we complain. Why are my taxes so high? Why this? Why, the, why does the state have so much? Why do they have their thumb on me so much? Well, I'll tell you why. Because we're not doing, part of the reason why is we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. We've walked away from our responsibilities, so they're taking on all those responsibilities, and now they have to tax us to have the money to do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not making excuses for our government. <laughs> I'm just saying we have a part to play in the complaints that we lodge against our government. We as Christian families are charged with bringing up our children and disciplining them. In many readings of the dominion mandate in Genesis, which we just read a little, discussed a little bit ago, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion over the earth. Many readings of that, many scholars who study these sorts of things say that that talks to us about being charged with our children's education. Did you know that? That most scholars or many scholars believe that that dominion mandate carries with it an obligation for parents, families, to educate their children. But we don't do these things. We allow state actors to discipline our children. We use the public school system not only as the way to educate our children, which is fine, but as a way to raise our children. I'm not saying all parents do this. Don't, don't get me wrong. We are sending our kid, two of our youngest to a public school system. We're not using them as a, a babysitting tool. But some parents do, don't they? You know the parents that do that. Just get them out of my hair. I don't want them. I don't want to deal with them. Just get them to the school each day. We're turning discipline over to our public school system. And we allow our public school systems to indoctrinate our children in all sorts of anti-Christian and secular philosophies. And we don't do anything about it. Yet we're charged by covenant to educate our children. And we don't do it. Again, let me be clear. I'm not saying this about every individual family or person. I'm just saying as a whole nation, as a church universal, we're failing in this regard. Fourthly, we as Christians are called to make disciples and be made into disciples. Yet we simply come to church so often each Sunday and watch the show, rarely giving anything back and only occasionally teaching, serving, and loving. And of course, the list could go on and on. And of course, all of us are guilty of all of these things at different times in our lives. In other words, we're not doing what God has called us to do, are we? Let's be honest. Don't raise your hand here. I'm not asking for hands. But how many folks in here can confidently say that you're doing everything you can to fulfill your side of the covenant? Again, I don't want to see hands, but I guarantee you, if we're honest, I wouldn't see hands anyway, would I? Because none of us are. If we search our hearts, we search our minds, we search our history we'd have to admit that we're not keeping these covenants. We're not, definitely not doing it as well as God is doing it, unconditionally, permanently. I just finished reading a book by a guy, two, two gentlemen, named, one named Herbert Hydus, excuse me, Herbert Titus, <laughs> and the other one, Gerald Thompson. Their book is entitled America's Heritage, Constitutional Liberty. Pretty cool book. You might recognize the name Titus. He was a vice presidential candidate for the Constitution Party back in 1996. Ran against Bill Clinton. Of course, he lost. He's a constitutional lawyer. The book is really cool because it, he dispels the myth. I would encourage you to get this book. if you. He dispels the myth that our nation was not, was not founded as a, on Christian principles. He dispels that myth. He goes back and he looks at the framers, what they believed, what they said, what they wrote, and he makes a case. And he shows our country was founded. I won't say as a Christian nation, but it was founded by Christians in accordance with Christian principles. And there's no doubt about that. But one of the things he does in this book is he calls our nation back 
He says, I, we need to come back to our roots. You Christians, he says, need to come back to your roots. It was really convicting for me. If you want to save our democracy, if you want to save our republic, if you want to save the freedoms that we have to worship and be the people of God that he's called us to be in this nation, then you need to do three things, he says. First, you need to reacquaint yourself with the Word of God. You need to study it. You need to pray through it. You need to dig out and mine its truth. You need to, if you haven't read the Bible, he'd say, read it. If you've never studied the basic principles and stories and covenants of the Bible, study them. If you don't know the biblical characters, get to know them. Reacquaint yourself with the Word of God. Secondly, he says you need to repent of your sins. You need to say, I'm sorry to God. And mean it. Right? And then thirdly, recommit yourself to the Word of God. Take action to be all you can be for God. Realize who you are and whose you are and strike out on mission. Reacquaint, repent, and recommit. But maybe you're saying something like this, Pastor, that sounds great. But you're talking about Herbert Titus and Gerald Thompson. They're just fallen men like us. Are there any, I mean, where do you get this? You just, is he just pulling this out of thin air? Are you just following some false teacher? And the answer is no. Because in the passage that we just read this morning, we see these three principles being enacted by Josiah and the people of God. Let me set the stage for you about what's going on in this passage. Josiah was one of only five good kings of Judah in the Bible. He was one of only five. I won't ask anybody to tell me who those five were, but I'll tell you. Abijah, which is a very unknown king of Judah. Jehoshaphat, Jotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah. The others were all bad, horrible, destructive, unspiritual, ungodly leaders of Judah. I want to talk about the progression of kings leading up to Josiah, just a few. I'm going to start with Hezekiah, his great-grandfather. Great Hezekiah was, if you heard my list a minute ago, he was one of the good ones. He was a good, God-fearing king. Ruled for 29 years over Judah. Restored the temple after some bad kings before him and removed the idols from the temple. He withheld the siege against Jerusalem from the Assyrian king, Sennacherib. And in 2 Kings 18, verse 5, it says that no one could be compared with Hezekiah neither before or after. In other words, Hezekiah was the greatest of the greatest. The great-grandfather of Josiah was a great, wonderful, God-fearing, courageous lion of a, of a believer. I was going to say of a Christian. <laughs> wasn't a Christian yet, right? A lion of a believer. If you were here for War Room, right, the movie, Hezekiah is like the little woman who went and prayed. What was her name? Lily or what? I can't remember her name. What is it? Clara. She was a lion of a prayer warrior. Well, this was Hezekiah, a lion of a believer. But then Manasseh, his son, came along. Manasseh ruled for a long time, 55 years. And he allowed foreign cults to come in. He allowed polytheism to come in. He endorsed Baal and Asherah worship. Baal worship, you've heard of that before, right? In fact, he participated in all of this worship. He even persecuted the prophets of God. Here's the king of Judah persecuting the prophets of God unto death. Then his son, Ammon, came along, ruled for two years. He carried on his father's ways of idolatry and worshiping pagan images. In fact, he was so bad, he died by assassination. His servants killed him. That's why he only lasted two years. 
Well, by that time, it's just two years of rain. His kids were still pretty young. But Josiah was one of his boys, became the king. At eight years old, because his dad was murdered, assassinated, Josiah comes on the stage. But he, I mean, think about Josiah. What's he known? I mean, he probably didn't know his great-grandfather. He probably knew his grandfather and his father. But what, did, what were they doing? They were worshiping idols, pagan cults. Baal, he didn't know any different. He didn't know any better. So one day, Josiah says, you know what? Hey, go search the temple out. Let's dig around in there and see what we can find. Guess what they found? What Scripture tell us? Hilkiah the priest found what? A book of the law. Imagine that. Something that nobody had probably looked at for a long time. He finds it. And he reads it. And Josiah listens. And he hears the word of God. He reacquaints himself. Then he repents. Then he recommits. Let's look at it. All right, this is what Josiah did. Now, the characters in here Hilkiah is the high priest of the temple, uh, Shaphan is the king's secretary. So he's it's on the staff, the king's staff. And Huldah is a prophet who happens to be a female. So ladies, there are female prophets in the Bible, right? We know some of them. This is one of them, Huldah. And she does a wonderful thing as we read through this passage. She brings the truth of God. Finally, she's probably thinking, man, finally somebody's listening, right? Finally somebody's listening. She brings the truth and it affects Josiah's life immensely. Let's look at it real quick. So the first thing we got to do, according to Titus and Thompson and according to our passage, is we got to become reacquainted with the Word of God. Verses 8 and 10, Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law. Man, look at this. I searched and I found this thing. It's pretty cool. In the temple of the Lord, he gave it to Shaphan who read it. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it to the in the presence of the king. So he reads it. So here we see Josiah getting reacquainted with the word of God. He'd probably never heard it before. At least not like that. No high priest had ever read it to him. Certainly his parents didn't read it to him. He was just going along fat, dumb, and happy thinking his pagan idol worship was a thing to do. But he hears the word of God. He gets reacquainted with it. He takes time to listen to his counselors. He humbly submits to the word. Again, remember, he's coming. You've got to remember the context. He's coming out of not knowing anything about this. Remember when, when you were a kid, there were certain things and paradigms, the way you saw the world. And then when you went out and got your first job or you went off to school or whatever you did, suddenly things started hitting you in the face. Whoa, I didn't. Is the world really like that? I'll tell you honestly, for me, just the... Just the hardness of life hit me in college. It was probably college where it hit me. Because I grew up in a rural area, loving parents, uh, you know, good friends. I didn't get hit with a lot of reality as a kid. I, some, but I had a pretty good childhood. And then I went to college and got out in the real world, went in the Army, did those things. And all of a sudden I felt like people are mean. There are a lot of mean people out there. People that will stab you in the back. I didn't experience a lot of that as a kid. People that'll say mean things and mean it. Not just guys jabbing each other and fooling around. Oh, by the way, you can actually get physically injured and emotionally injured. And right? Reality hit me, and it was a wake-up. And I feel like that's what's happening to Josiah here. It's like this wake-up call. Whoa, there's another world out there that I never knew about. But he gets reacquainted through humility, inquisitiveness, submission, he gets reacquainted with the Word of God. That's number one. Number two, repentance, right? That's our step number two. Verses 11 through 13, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. Now, if you don't know, if you've seen this, you see this throughout the Old Testament, when people tear their robes, that means they're convicted. They're feeling high emotion, extreme emotion over something. Oftentimes, it's repentance. They know they've done something wrong, and so they tear their clothes. This is an indication right here that Josiah is repenting. 
He's realized his error and the error of his father and the error of his grandfather. He tears his clothes. Verse 12, he gave orders to Hilkiah the priest, go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. In other words, go, please, find out more. Go to the prophet, who's going to be Huda, right? Go to her. Find out more. I want to know more. I don't want to miss anything else. Go find out more. Great is the Lord's anger, this is Josiah. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of the book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written in it concerning us. Folks, these words that he's saying are all about true repentance. He's tearing his clothes. That's an action showing his repentance. The words that I just read are an admission of guilt. He is repenting of his sin. He's saying, you know what? I have done it wrong. My family has done it wrong for so long. Then Huldah, the prophet, recognizes his repentance. She recognizes it. And she says in verse 19, because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes, so she recognizes it, and wept in my presence, she recognizes the mission. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. In other words, repentance accepted. If we repent of our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9 says, doesn't it? And this is an example of that. The Lord says, I saw it. I saw the repentance in your actions. I saw the repentance in your admission, and I forgive you. Number three, step number three. We not only have to reacquaint, we not only have to repent, but thirdly, we have to recommit our lives to God and to his word. This is chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest, everybody, right? He gets everybody together. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, all of it. That's probably a long day, wasn't it? (laughs) But he read it all which had been found in the temple of the Lord. So he found this thing, this piece of gold, and he's reading it to everybody. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in his book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. In other words, because of his leadership, he went out there, he read it. He showed the conviction of his heart. The people saw it, and they said, wow, we have gone wrong, and they all recommitted their lives. In other words, everyone repented, and they recommitted right there together in community, right there at the temple with the priests, prophets, and everyone. We're going to do this right. We've done it wrong for so long. We've now repented of our sins, and moving forward, we're going to do it right. Josiah didn't give up because of his sin. He and the people didn't ignore their sins. They didn't stay mired in their sins. They quickly brought, or he quickly brought the people together, and together they recommitted themselves to the Lord. Isn't this a beautiful picture of exactly what Titus and Thompson proposed in their book? If we want to be covenant bearers that God has called us to be, if we want to be team players that he's called us to, to be, if we want to do all that we can do to impact this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we have to reacquaint ourselves with his word. We have to repent of our sins and we have to recommit our lives to his work and to his word. Do you believe that this morning? And folks, that's as much of an individual reality as it is a corporate reality. So individually, if we're going to do all we can do for God, if we're going to be the disciples that he's called us to be, if we're going to make disciples and fulfill the Great Commission, teach, love, and serve, then we have to reacquaint ourselves with his word. We've got to get to know it. Secondly, we've got to repent of our sins. We've got to say, you know what? I haven't been doing it or I haven't been doing these things and I need to recommit. And then, then we need to recommit. 
recommit to following him each and every day, is, day of our lives. Josiah goes on to be the one, probably the second greatest king <laughs> of Judah. Because he picked up where his great-grandfather left off, Hezekiah. But it didn't just happen. He had to first take action to find the truth, to reacquaint. And then he had to have the willpower and the courage to say, I'm, I failed, I'm sorry, and repent. Then he had to have the further courage and fortitude to step out and say, and we're going to do it differently from now on. Folks, corporately, we need to do that as a church as well. We need to reacquaint ourselves with the Word of God. And I mean the church universal, right? So many churches today, and I'm, I'm closing here, but so many churches today in our world are not even preaching and teaching the Bible. They're not reacquainting their people with the Bible. Many of their people are like Josiah was before he got reacquainted. They don't even know what the truth of the Bible is. They've never read it. They've not been taught it. The preachers haven't talked about it from the pulpit. And they're just lost. If we want a revolution in this nation and in this world, we've got to get back to the Bible. And then we've got to repent. As a church and as individuals, we've got to say, I, 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 we've not been doing this well. And then recommit, thirdly, to those principles. But we can't change the world, can we? Not today. But we can change our lives today. So my challenge to you is this. Reacquaint. Repent and recommit. You can do that. You can do that starting today. You know what it takes to reacquaint yourself with the Word of God? It just takes opening it up, just picking this thing up, just picking somewhere and just starting to read. How many people knew this story of Josiah? I'm not, I'm not asking for hands. Some of you did, some of you didn't. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. How many people knew this story of Josiah? I bet you there's a fair number of people in here that don't. Probably never heard this story before. You know what it takes to reacquaint yourself with this story? Just opening it up and reading it. And the story before it, the story about Hezekiah. Getting into the New Testament, maybe digging a little deeper into Colossians than you ever have, or Galatians. Or maybe Revelation, that book that nobody wants to talk about. That's how we reacquaint ourselves. We just get in there and start doing it. God will do the work. The Holy Spirit will move inside of us. He'll, he'll show us the truth of it. And then when He does show us the truth and we realize, I'm not living by that truth, then we repent, right? And then once we repent and we know where we've gone wrong, we say, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to do it differently. And folks, if every one of us did that, then our church would do that, right? And if our church did that, and the church down the road did the same thing, and the church down the road did the same thing, and all of a sudden, all the churches in Lynchburg, Amherst County were doing the same thing. And then all the churches in Virginia were doing the same thing. I can guarantee you we would start having a, stop having a lot of the problems that we're having right now in our nation and in our commonwealth. And when I hear Christians complain about this governor or that governor or this senator or that senator or the president or anything, the first thing that jumps in my mind, and when I'm complaining about it, the first thing that jumps into my mind is this. But what am I not doing as a Christian? What am I not doing to fulfill my role, my covenantal role before God? Because I bet if I did my role better, and you did your role better, and the church did its role better, then our nation's leaders, they might not do any better, but they certainly wouldn't have as much control over the things that they do. How are we not fulfilling our covenant before God? That's the question I want you to ask yourself. How are you not fulfilling your covenant relationship with God? Reacquaint. Repent. Recommit. Let's pray. Father, I know it's it's difficult to say we're wrong about things. It's difficult to know what the truth is sometimes because we're so busy. I don't have time to reacquaint that much. Maybe a couple minutes a day, I don't know, maybe not. I, so much stuff is going on. I, 
But Lord, to call on our lives is to make place for you, to make time for you. To re- Josiah was a king. He certainly had better things to do, so, so to speak, than to go search in the temple for some book. But he saw that it was a need, and he went. They, started, they found it, and, and he took the time out of his certainly busy schedule to read it, to listen to it, to think about it, to ponder it. Then he took time to say, you know what? I've done wrong. He took time to investigate further. He, he took time to repent. Then he took time to bring the people together and recommit. In other words, if a king of a nation has time, then certainly we do. And oh, by the way, when he took that time, it changed his life. It not only changed his life, it changed a kingdom's life. It not only changed a kingdom's life, it changed our lives even today because what Josiah did trickles down to us even today. The point is, if we take the time to give to you, you will bless us. Deuteronomy 28. Not just us, but generations to come. It will pay dividends. It's like the best investment we can make in our lives is to give you time. But we oftentimes don't do that because we think we're so busy. My encouragement, Lord, is to touch each of us and show us the ways, even this week, that we can take time to reacquaint, to repent, and to recommit. We can do this. We don't need to be controlled by the world, politicians. We don't need to be controlled by our jobs. We can take control. If a king can do it, we can do it. So show us the way we can do that, Lord. This week, even this week, Don't let us miss the opportunity to reacquaint, to repent, and to recommit. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, folks, I hope you have a communion element uh, with you. If you don't, please raise your hand and the ushers will get that to you. But today is our communion Sunday. We want to go through our service of communion. And as we go through this today, what I want you to think about is what we talked about today. Again, don't just make this a check the block. Take an opportunity to look at in this moment while we commune with Christ. Where is it that I need to reacquaint? Where is it that I need to repent? Where is it that I need to recommit? Where is it that I need to become more like Christ? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Do you hear the covenantal language in there? Not just the word covenant, but God did these things for us. He was faithful to us in these ways. He made a new covenant with us. This is all the stuff we were talking about. God's covenant, His promises are sure. When the Lord Jesus ascended, He promised to be with us always in the power of Your Word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which He gave Himself up for us, He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Do you hear that cry? The cry of obedience? that we might be for him, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. All right. Let me see if my manual dexterity will let me get this done. Here we go. So he took that bread, didn't he? He broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Poured out for you and for many, for all time, right? For the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And by that simple act, God instituted, Christ instituted a remembrance ceremony that has been done for over 2,000 years 
by people around the world in all different cultures, of all different races, to bring us together under one body of Christ. It doesn't matter if a Christian is worshiping today in the United States, in Amherst County, across the country, in Alaska, across the world, in Africa, and Asia, sometimes in basements because they can't do it openly. All Christians today, we're all worshiping the same God. We're all worshiping under the same body of Christ. We all have the same promises. In those churches today, around the world, that are doing communion, we've all done something together right here that has been done for over 2,000 years. We witness to the realities of Christ's work on that cross and His resurrection with people throughout history. Isn't that amazing? It blows my mind every time I think about it. And I hope it blows yours too. And the people that we've witnessed with, so many of them, including many of you, have said, have reacquainted themselves with the Word of God, have repented and have recommitted. And that's what I pray for each of you today. If you've not done that in your life, That's the call on your life. Right now. Using the example of Josiah, search it out. Search your heart. Repent of your sin. And recommit your life to Him. Father, thank You for what You're doing in the life of our church. Thank You for what You're doing in the life of hearts of the people right here today. And I pray that you would show us the ways that we need to reacquaint, that we need to repent, and that we need to recommit. And that we would do that as individuals and as a church today. Even today. May we seek out your heart. And may we become the lions of the faith that you've called us to be. Courageous. Active. Resiliently fighting against the world that's trying to take us out in your power and in your name. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
question is, is that truly our heart song? Do we truly believe we need God? When Josiah heard those words in the book of the law, it immediately hit him that he needed God. He needed God. He couldn't go forward without Him. Have you ever been in a place in your life like that? Where you knew if you took another step without God, you were going to fall flat on your face. You were going to go over the cliff. You were going to be destroyed. That you needed Him. We've heard the stories of faith like that. We've heard the story of Martin Luther traveling through a field, the famous story, and the lightning storm comes all around him. And he falls to his belly thinking he's going to die getting struck by lightning and he calls out to God God I need you I recommit my life to you just don't kill me right he knew he couldn't go one more step not even a physical step further without God and he became one of the greatest reformers in church history folks that can be your story as well you can have a Martin Luther or a Josiah story today but it takes that belief, that honest, heartfelt belief that I need Jesus. I can't do it without Him. But you know how you're going to get there? You're only going to get there if you take step number one, and that's reacquainting yourself with Him. Maybe you strayed to the left or right of Jesus. Maybe He's not that important to you right now. If you get back with Him, hand in hand, close to Him, reacquaint yourself with Him, reintroduce yourself, hello, I'm John, <laughs> Bob, I'm Mark. I'm Sarah. Whomever, right? And let Jesus come back into your life. And then you repent of the ways that you've disobeyed Him, thumbed your nose at Him, walked away from Him, and then recommit your life to Him, just like Josiah, just like Martin Luther. You can be one of the greatest as well as you do the wonderful work that God has for you in this world. So that's the challenge. The challenge is to have your Josiah story today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he give you his peace. God bless. Go in peace. We'll see you next time.